here, there's a big banner, and this says Total War, Shortest War. So they're saying, if you want the war to end quickly, you'll support this idea of Total War. Now, this speech occurs on 18th February, 1943. This is just a few weeks after the surrender at Stalingrad. The German regime, the Nazis, cannot hide how massive a tragedy for Germany the defeat at Stalingrad was. They just they can't hide it. Everybody everybody's lost somebody they know at Stalingrad. So they don't deny it, right? They don't try to play it down. They they say, yeah, it's, it's a bad thing. But they kind of cloak it then in this call for greater sacrifice and greater work. This is the Berlin Sports Palace where this is taking place, where this audience takes place. And there are 14,000 people that attend this speech. 14,000 people attend this speech. Now, this four, these 14,000 people, these aren't just people that came in off the streets. Every one of the people that attended the speech was, was selected. They were selected because they were known to be Nazi fanatics. They were known to have a fanatical devotion to the regime. And so they knew when Goebbels you know, wants a reaction from the crowd, he's going to get it. Um, he claims, they claim that this crowd represented a broad cross-section of German society, people from all professions and classes, but as I say, virtually everybody there is a member of the Nazi party, and they are, like I say, pretty, pretty radical and devoted. Um, Goebbels states, Goebbels stated with reference to Stalingrad, he says, quote, we currently face a military challenge in the East. There is no point in disputing the seriousness of the situation. I refuse to give you a false impression of the situation that could lead to false conclusions. Perhaps giving the German people a false sense of security that is altogether inappropriate for the present situation. It is understandable that, as a result of wide-ranging deceptions and bluffs by the Bolshevist government, we did not properly evaluate the Soviet Union's war potential. Only now do we see its true scale. That is why the battle our soldiers face in the East exceeds in, exceeds in its hardness, dangers, and difficulties all human imagining. It demands our full national strength. Our full national strength. So unlike previous military setbacks, Goebbels had always downplayed them. Well, it's not such a big deal, right? But he can't, he, like I said, he can't ignore what's happened at Stalingrad. So he goes in the opposite direction. He doesn't sugarcoat it. And in fact, he kind of says, this is, now, now stuff's getting real. Now stuff's getting real. We didn't, we didn't appreciate the danger in the East before we do now. Which, surprisingly, <laughs> was, was, there's some truth to that. But he says, it is the German Reich, the German military, the German state, that is the only thing that stands between civilization and Bolshevism. It's the only thing that stands between civilization, of Germanic civilization and Bolshevism. Uh, but this is also, because they're Nazis, of course, this is, is sprinkled heavily with anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic messages. He said, quote, we see Jewry as a direct threat to every nation. Jewry is a contagious infection. Germany, in any event, has no intention of bowing before this Jewish threat, but rather intends to act at the right moment, using, if necessary, the most total and radical measures to deal with Jewry. Terrorist Jewry had 200 million people to serve it in Russia. And then Goebbels, what he does in this speech is he begins to ask his audience questions. He begins to ask them questions. He asks whether black marketers, meaning people that are, that are hoarding stuff, stealing stuff to sell for their own profit on the black market, not going through regular channels, 
should they be executed? And right now, they're just being arrested, might go to jail. Um, but he's saying, should we execute these people? Because these people are clearly working against the interests of Germany. Should we execute them? Of course, the audience cheers, yes. Shirkers, people that don't work as much as everybody else, should they be executed? Crowd cheers, yes, yes. He says, should women be fully mobilized for the war effort? Because Hitler, remember, he'd always shied away from that, right? Should women be fully mobilized for the war effort? They scream, yes, yes. He said, should workers, should workers put in 16-hour days? And they scream, yes, yes. The audience roars its approval. They roar its approval. And toward the end of the speech, of course, he asked that question, do you want total war? If necessary, do you want war more total and radical than anything that we can even imagine today? And again, the audience screams, yes, yes. <laughs> the very last line of the speech reads, People, rise up and storm break loose. People, rise up and storm break loose. Now, this idea of total war, and what he's talking about here is, the, 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 the term total war is actually first used, was first used by Ludendorff during the First World War. Ludendorff used that term, total war. And what he meant by total war is essentially you are massing everything in the state for the war, everything. And this concept, he's the first one to give it that term. In fact, his, his, his memoirs of the First World War were called like total war. But the concept goes back even further. The concept goes back to the French Revolution. During the French Revolution, the French revolutionaries, um, you know, every young man was expected, of course, to fight in the armies. Women were expected to <laughs> sew uniforms and, you know, collect items and stuff that, that men would need. Uh, young children were expected to contribute where they could. Old, old men, it's funny because like in the official government documents it's like old men should stand in the town squares and exhort love of country and love of France. You know, So that was that was kind of really um, in 1793 the French introduced something called the Levee en Masse which is this mass conscription scheme. And so the French are the first people to really have this idea of everyone in society is, is mobilizing and working for the war effort. Okay, so it begins with the French Revolution. And then, um, of course, we get to World War I, and of course that war was just... The entire economy of Germany is geared, virtually the entire economy is geared toward the war effort. You know, bare subsistence for everything else, and then just everything is going toward the war effort. And, and, and Ludendorff really expanded that. But now, and, and you see, as war becomes more technical, as it becomes more um, mechanized, as it becomes more mechanical, you have a lot more industries that need to support it, right? And not, you, you know, all the, the different weapons of war, airplanes, tanks, submarines, all these things you've got to build, not to mention all the things a soldier carries. Um, you have to have people working constantly to keep this stuff going, to keep because you're losing so much of it constantly. So that's what they're talking about. No, when Goebbels is calling for total war, he is calling for the you know as much of the economy as possible to be geared toward war and the people to work like say 16-hour days, 16-hour days in order to to fight. But then he's also saying people that aren't contributing should face severe penalties, up to and including execution, right? People that aren't contributing to the war should face severe penalties. So that's, that, that, that's, that's essentially what he's meaning when he's talking here about total war. Now, Albert Speer, of course, Hitler's architect and later Minister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, uh, he would later write about this speech um, except for Hitler's most successful public meetings, I had never seen an audience so effectively roused to fanaticism. 
Back in his home, Goebbels astonished me by analyzing what had seemed to be a purely emotional outburst in terms of its psychological effects, much as an experienced actor might have done. He, uh, he, was, also, he was also satisfied with his audience that evening. So Goebbels, this, this is like Goebbels' masterpiece speech, right? This is, this is the height of, of the speech's propaganda, as far as Goebbels is concerned, right? And certainly Goebbels was the best public speaker in Germany after Hitler, right? And he just he had people in the palm of his hand. But really, he's preparing this, in this, for this speech, he's preparing the German people for the hardships to come. It's only going to get worse, and the regime knows this. Now, the regime certainly, their attitude is, they can still find a way, maybe not to, to win total victory in the war, but maybe they could find a way to, 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 to have a negotiated peace or fight their enemies to a standstill, but it was going to take everything. Because frankly, by this point, by February of 1943, Germany is just getting weaker and weaker, and the Allies are getting stronger and stronger. So they're aware of that. So they're hoping to now fight their enemies to some kind of a standstill, right? To some kind of a draw. The regime, up until this point, had always preached, Goebbels' propaganda had always preached, victory is around the corner. Victory is around the corner. We're just there. Just one or two more campaigns, one or two more um, uh, you know, big pushes, and we'll win the war. Now, they're not saying that anymore. Now they're saying, prepare for the long haul. Prepare for the long haul. It's going to be long and hard and not nearly as, as easy as we thought it was going to be. Also, too, it doubles down, the speech doubles down on the regime's anti-Semitism. Again, they talk about the Jews and how the Jews are responsible. And, of course, it doubles down, obviously, on the anti-Bolshevism, the anti-communism. Now, here's the thing, too, and here's the plans within the plans, the plot within the plot. Everything I've told you was Goebbels' way of kind of selling this longer, harder war to the German people. Kind of essentially saying, okay, it's not going to be a quick victory, it's going to take a while, it's going to be tough, and we're all in it. So that's what he's doing there on the, on the broad scale. However, these are Nazis, and they're always competing with each other, right? They're always empire building, they're always... They're always stabbing each other in the back to get Hitler's favor or working towards the Fuhrer. Goebbels, by this point, desperately wants to be foreign minister. Okay? He wants to be the foreign minister of Germany. Now, who is the existing foreign minister? Von Ribbentrop, exactly, von Ribbentrop. Joachim von Ribbentrop is the foreign minister, and again, von Ribbentrop is absolutely incompetent. Von Ribbentrop is just not a smart guy. <coughs> and everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. And Von Ribbentrop, um, he, he wants, Goebbels is speaking poison about Ribbentrop into Hitler's ear, as are other people that try and get rid of him. And Goebbels wants this job. Goebbels wants to be foreign minister more than anything. But um, it's not going to happen. Hitler, Hitler, Hitler will stick with Ribbentrop until the end of the war. So Goebbels is kind of frustrated in that ambition. But that, too, is another major part of the speech. He's trying to impress Hitler. He's trying to show how competent he is and how fanatical he is and how committed to victory, or at least a stalemate, that he is. Um, and this kind of empire building, this Nazi empire building, of course, this... This doesn't end once the war begins. It only intensifies. Nazis increasingly are fighting against each other to try to, you know, there's, there's, there's a, uh, th there are coalitions that build up, and I, I'm not going to get into all that right now, but just suffice it to say that goes on and on and on.